By the way, all the links and more that are mentioned in this presentation will be sent in the accompanying email, so you needn't write them down. An Introduction to the Fibonacci Series Leonardo Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician considered by some to be the most talented Western mathematician of the Middle Ages. So saith Wikipedia. In the year 12,002, Fibonacci wrote a book titled Liberabaci. No, not Liberacci. Liberabaci. In the book, he described a number sequence that goes as follows. 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on. The first two numbers are defined to be 0 and 1, and then every number that follows is the sum of the previous two as shown below. Hey, check this out. This is a laser pointer that comes along with PowerPoint. So here we have 0 and 1, the sum is 1. Go to the next pair. 1 and 1, the sum is 2, and we carry that down here. Then we have 1 and 2, the sum is 3, that goes up here, it's the next element. Then 2 and 3, the sum is 5, so that goes here. Then we have 3 and 5, the sum is 8, and that goes up here, and you can follow the rest yourself. Hey, this laser point is really cool, but just make sure you never point it at someone's eye. Now, taking the ratio of successive pairs, the deeper you go into the sequence, the closer that ratio approximates a value of 1.618 Zero three three nine eight eight seven blah 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 is shown below. It's a uh, one of those uh, irrational numbers that uh, doesn't repeat and goes on forever. So we're looking at again. Uh, we'll turn on our laser pointer. Here we have the first two numbers one and one. The ratio is one. Uh, one or two. The ratio is one to two. Two and three. The ratio is one to one point five. Then we start getting interesting. Here we have. 3, 3 to 5 is the same as 1 to 1.66667. And going down here, we see that uh, as we get progressively deeper into the, into the uh, sequence, that we start approaching this number 1.6180, followed by a bunch of other numbers. Now, it can be shown that the ratio approaches 1 plus the square root of 5 divided by 2. This value is known as the golden ratio and is called phi. The golden ratio was known long before Fibonacci came up with his number series and has fascinated mathematicians and philosophers for thousands of years. It is thought by some that the Greek sculptor Phidias designed the statuary in the Parthenon with embodiments of the golden ratio. Euclid gave the first recorded definition of the golden ratio. Johannes Kepler, the great astronomer, found that the golden ratio was the limit of the ratio of consecutive Fibonacci numbers. That's what we were just looking at. And he described the golden, the golden ratio as a precious jewel. In 1909, American mathematician Mark Barr suggested that the Greek letter phi be used as the symbol for the golden ratio because, because it is the first letter in the name of Phidias, the Parthenon sculptor. Throughout history, rectangles whose ratio of long side to short side is the golden ratio are considered to be the most aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Hey, wait a minute, who says so? <laughs> oh boy. Apparently, the Geometry Center at the University of Minnesota says so, and a host of others. If you do an internet search, you'll find plenty. Well, in the interest of science, I have conducted a poll of our own Renaissance Society and asked you to tell me which of these rectangles is the most aesthetically pleasing to you. The rectangle number four is the one constructed with the proportions of the golden ratio. So which one did you choose? Well, here are the poll results. You had a, we had a sample group of 20, and it turns out that uh, three Renaissance tiers chose none. They couldn't find any reason to select an aesthetically pleasing rectangle, and their comments were, I do not find these rectangles coincide with what aesthetics mean to me. They are all rectangles to me, and I have no aesthetical feelings regarding your test. 
Okay. Only two Renaissanceeteers, Jim Jansen and Peter Allen, chose the golden ratio rectangle. Interestingly, they are both residents of New Hampshire, and to my knowledge, they are the only New Hampshire residents in this sample. Hmm. This poll shows no tendency towards choosing the golden ratio rectangle over the others. It was even beaten by no choice at all. So what might we conclude from this? Here are some possibilities. Possibility number one. My poll is fundamentally flawed because it did not yield the expected result that has been considered to be true throughout history, according to University of Minnesota Geometry Department. Possibility number two. Only people from New Hampshire have a sense of what is aesthetically pleasing. Could be. Possibility number three. The notion that the golden ratio defines what is aesthetically pleasing is bulldust. I don't want to bias your opinion, but I'm inclined to go with number three. And speaking of bulldust, you got to love this. Pepsi Company paid $1 million to Peter Arnell to redo their logo using the golden ratio in the design. So we have the old Pepsi logo plus a million dollars and Peter Arnell equals the new logo. Now if that doesn't make you want to buy Pepsi, what will? I'm not kidding. Read Arnell's 27-page document titled Breathtaking Design Strategy. It's a real hoot. You know, I've got to give him a lot of credit. It must take considerable talent just to present this stuff with a straight face. But the golden ratio is just one little interesting aspect of the Fibonacci series. And in fact, the golden ratio was discovered many centuries before Fibonacci was born. There is much more interesting Fibonacci stuff to be found. Let's take a look at the Fibonacci spiral. We begin by drawing a series of squares whose dimensions are Fibonacci numbers. The first number in the sequence is zero, so that is nothing. The second number is one, so we place a square with sides of size one. The third number is also one, so we place another square of size one. The next number is two, so we place a square of size two. Then comes three, next is five, as you can see, each time we place a new square, we form a new rectangle. And each new rectangle is closer to the golden ratio rectangle. See how aesthetically appealing they have gotten already? It just keeps getting better. Next comes eight, and then 13. Now let's draw our spiral. We begin where the corners of the two size one squares meet, away from the size two square and we draw an arc to the opposite corner of the size one square. From that point, we draw a new arc to the opposite corner of the size two square. From there, we draw a new arc to the opposite corner of the size three square. We continue by drawing an arc to the opposite corner of the size five square, and then to the opposite corner of the size eight square. And from there, we draw one more arc to the opposite side of the size 13 square. The spiral that we have formed is called a Fibonacci spiral. Let's compare this Fibonacci spiral to that of the Nautilus shell. There is some resemblance, but the Nautilus spiral is looser at the center and tighter outside. But that doesn't stop Fibonacciists from claiming that the Nautilus is a Fibonacci spiral. Fibonacci in nature. The spirals of pine cones and sunflower heads involve Fibonacci numbers. In this photo of the cone of a pitch pine, the spirals have been highlighted for easy counting. There are eight spirals bending to the left as they open out, indicated in red. Likewise, there are 13 spirals opening to the right, indicated by blue traces. Eight and 13 are consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Cones of other pines exhibit five and eight spirals, two other consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So Fibonacci numbers do often appear in nature, but there seems to be a tendency to paste a Fibonacci spiral over every image that has a curve in it and say, 
Hey look, yet another example of the incredible power of Fibonacci. Here's the Mona Lisa with the Fibonacci spile overlaid on it. Here's a picture of Hurricane Sandy. Now, not all storms look like this, but this one has been selected because it does. Uh, here's a, a young lady throwing water in the air from her hair, and look at that, it's a Fibonacci spiral, except notice that these black images are not squares. I guess it's okay to distort things to make your point. Well, I have bent your ear long enough, and now I relate the story from Chris Bohr that inspired this lengthy dissertation. There is a town on the North Sea coast of Belgium called Dipan, and Chris often goes there on holiday. About a year ago, the town council commissioned artist Norbert Francis Attar to create a sculpture celebrating the Fibonacci series. Attar's work was called Boundaries of Infinity and was installed last summer. This is all well and good, except Mr. Attar was not very good at math, and he made an error on the 20th number of the Fibonacci series. Of course, all the numbers that followed were wrong as well. Oh well, it's not like it's carved in stone. Oh wait, it is carved in stone. The mayor has demanded that the mistake be corrected at the sculptor's expense. Thus far, the artist is unwilling to do so, and the mayor plans to take legal action. Chris Bohr, being a great champion of trivial causes, has petitioned the town council to not correct the mistake, as a mistake in such a series renders it more interesting, he says. Also, the Fibonacci series is trivial, whereas the Dupin Fibonacci-ish series is not. On October 31st, Chris will play a visit to the Dupin sculpture in homage to the beauty of mistakes in maths, and he hopes that at that time to show the town burgers that their series is some other iterative number series akin to Fibonacci but different. And he would give that series a name, the Enpan series, meaning broken series in French, thus neatly encapsulating both the place, Dupin, the error, and at the same time irritating the Flemish inhabitants of Dupin by lending prominence to what they consider to be a foreign language. Godspeed to Chris in his quest. Here's the story URL. By the way, I have an alternative suggestion. I think that a sculpture called Boundaries of Infinity is a bit too confining. Perhaps the artist can rework the stone into a bas-relief carving of Buzz Lightyear with a word balloon above his head boldly stating, To infinity and beyond!